Welcome to Murder Mile. Today, I'm standing on William Mews in Knightsbridge SW1. Two roads west of the Goat Tavern, where William McSwan was treated to a farewell drink. Two streets west of the High Park bombing. And a short walk south of the fake SAS soldier and his cowardly initiation. Coming soon to Murder Mile. Hidden off the rather posh Lounge Square, William Mews was once a cul-de-sac, comprising of stables, where society's elite bragged that they kept their horses. Only to have a flunky shovel up the shit, as that is what the wealthy do. They boast about their success, only to have the little people do all the work. By the 1930s, William Mews had become a line of garages occupied by cab drivers whose families lived in the flats above. One exception was at number 21, where 27-year-old socialite Elvira Barney lived, boozed, debauched, and had her bad behaviour rewarded by society and her crimes excused by the law. On Tuesday the 31st of May 1932, in a place she had dubbed the Love Hut. Although the evidence stated that in a drunken emotional state, Elvira had shot her lover to death. The circumstances of the murder were so dubious that the truth was easily whitewashed by an adoring press who was so besotted by this beautiful but vapid rich kid that they made her the only victim and him the absolute culprit. My name is Michael, I'm your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 250, The Socialite's Premonition. Money. It can turn the good bad, the bad worse, the needy greedy and the wealthy blind. Born on the 22nd of January 1904, the early life of Elvira Enid Mullen was as pampered and privileged as any posh little prick whose first words were nanny, having been born with a silver spoon in every orifice. As the middle child of three siblings, to affluent stockbroker Sir John Mullins, manager of the London Stock Exchange, and his wife, Lady Mullins. With no need to understand the value of money, she was raised believing that everyone below her should be at her beck and call, and she had no understanding of why she couldn't have what she wanted, when she wanted it, and often without earning it. Following the death of her brother Cyril when she was only 12, what occupied her time wasn't a career, but the seeding of the sibling rivalry with her baby sister. Both described as society beauties, who were pretty, petite and auburn-haired. Although her younger sister Avril would make her parents proud by marrying in lofty circles, first to Ernest Simpson, the ex-husband of Wallace Simpson, whose relationship with King Edward VIII almost broke down the monarchy, and later to a Georgian royal prince, meaning that she would be titled as Princess Emma Ratinsky. Elvira saw herself as the rebel and the troublemaker. Like a petulant child, Elvira went out of her way to do everything her parents despised. In 1924, she studied at Lady Benson's Drama Academy. And although acting was seen as a disreputable profession for a young woman of means, under the stage name of Dolores Ashley, she appeared in The Blue Kitten, a musical about a waiter who pretended to be upper class so he could marry a socialite. In its run, it was only modestly received and barely lasted a season. And although the acting career of Dolores Ashley never went much further. This brief spark of stardom gave Elvira the notoriety and attention she craved 
as by 1924, she was already being heralded as part of the bright young things. The bright young things were the in crowd of the late 1920s and early 1930s. Like the Kardashians, only with talent, this fashionable set of wealthy bohemians lived by their own rules, poo pooed the stuffy Victorian values of their privileged upbringing, and caused as much scandal as possible by drinking heavily, imbibing illicit drugs, flouting the law and engaging in bisexual sex. The antics of the bright young things set the tabloid papers ablaze, making household names of these trend-setting luminaries, such as the photographer Cecil Beaton, actress Tallulah Bankhead, poet John Betjeman, playwright Noel Coward, novelist Barbara Cartland and G.K. Chesterton, renowned fascists the Mitford sisters, and Guy Burgess the spy, as well as Elizabeth Bowes Lyons, who was later the Queen Mother. Elvira wasn't as high profile as many, which is why, amongst such celebrities, her name is barely known today. But it was her erratic and often eccentric exploits which gave her such an infamous reputation. In 1924, Elvira got engaged to Charles Graves, a gossip journalist whose articles about the bright young things had established them as cultural icons, as opposed to being just privileged wastrels. These two were seen as the hot young couple, only it was Elvira's bizarre behaviour which ended their tempestuous relationship. In his 1951 autobiography, titled the bad old days. Charles doesn't name his fiancée, but states, the girl was the daughter of a rich businessman. Her home life was not particularly happy. I'd made the unfortunate error of mistaking sympathy for love. So I wrote her a note asking to break it off. Returning to his Chelsea flat, at 3 a.m. on a Saturday night, I was woken up by my guest, who said, There is a girl walking up and down the pavement. I think she has a revolver. I went to the window, which was on the first floor, and sure enough, there she was. An angry auburn haired beauty with a loaded gun. Knowing how unstable and volatile she was, he said to his guest, when you hear me undo the latch, open the window and attract her attention, I'll do the rest. It was a stratagem he'd mulled over and possibly put into practice several times before. As once the latch was unlocked, his guest whistled. Elvira looked up and Charles dashed out. It was time enough to grab the pistol. Luckily, I knew which wrist to grab. She tried to pull the trigger but the pistol fell to the pavement with a clang. Charles had a lucky escape, later stating, she was hysterical for some minutes. I made the girl sleep on the divan, while I sat out the night in an armchair to make sure she didn't run away or do herself any damage. When I saw her mother, I told her what had happened. She was horrified. It was an incident which wasn't reported to the police. And with Charles then being the editor of the Sunday Express, it didn't feature in any of the newspapers and besperched none of their names. Thus is the power of the wealthy and the influential. So why do I tell you this? It's because this is a premonition of things to come. In 1927, causing more consternation for her exacerbated parents, Elvira met John Sterling Barney at a party. Married the following year, it was a relationship bitterly opposed to by her family, 
which ended in frequent quarrels and fights, mostly because he wasn't a lord or a stockbroker, just a singer. By 1929, with her husband returning to America, Elvira Barney, as she was then known, continued her spiral out of control. By combining her drinking and late-night escapades, in an era when drink driving was still legal, with the purchase of a Delage D8, a French-built eight-cylinder motor car costing twice that of the average house, and with a 102 horsepower engine capable of speeds of 82 miles an hour on roads which had barely been improved since the days of the horse and cart. It was no surprise she had several accidents. In 1930, Elvira was arrested in Croydon, having crashed a car at speed while drunk. It was entirely her fault. But like the spoiled little rich girl she was, she furiously berated the constable, reminding him of her status, her name, her family, and threatening to get him the sack. Let off with a fine. A year later, she crashed that same car in Piccadilly Circus, breaking her jaw, losing a tooth, and getting just a slap on the wrist. The era of the bright young things was coming to a close. As with the Wall Street crash having plunged the world into recession, their kind of decadence and excesses were seen as nothing short of disgusting. But did they care? Some did, but others did not. As being born with no sense of the less fortunate, when the poor struggled, the powerful and the popular only ever worried about their own pleasures, and that included Elvira. Some may suggest that Elvira was only interested in herself, which is why, of the man she claimed to love and would ultimately murder, she said, I've known Michael for about a year. We were great friends, and he used to come and see me from time to time, but we were never a couple or an item. Similar to Elvira, Michael's upbringing was one of privilege, albeit of a lowly middle-class status. Born in Elgin in 1908, Thomas William Scott Stephen, also known as Michael, was the son of a prominent financier and a justice of the peace. As one of three competitive siblings, with his brother Francis becoming a respected solicitor and his other brother Harborn becoming the managing director of the Daily Telegraph and one of the most honoured airmen in the Battle of Britain. Unable to compete, Michael too saw himself as a rebel and a troublemaker. Educated, but unwilling to put in a hard day's work, although it was said that Michael was a dress designer, being denied an allowance by his father, he turned to gambling and became a bit of a dandy. And although similar, this is how the story would split, with the press deciding who the public should root for based on who was the most popular and who was not as once again, money and power would win. During the trial, being dead, Michael couldn't defend himself. Described as unemployed and ridiculed as a sponger and a scoundrel, they ignored the facts that Elvira was no better, just more popular. Many called him a nobody, as if she was a somebody. And whereas they both drank, did drugs and engaged in promiscuous sex. His faults were seen as a moral, whereas hers was a beloved part of her character. It is said that they met in Paris, and for some time before May 1932, the month that Michael was murdered, he had moved into her little flat above a garage at 21 William Mews, which they had titled The Love Hut. As in her volatile engagement with Charles Graves and a jealous marriage to John Barney, there was no denying that Elvira and Michael loved each other as much as they hated each other. 
As in so many letters found, Michael wrote, Darling dear, forgive me all the dreadful things I've done. I promise to be better and kinder so you won't be frightened anymore. I love you, only you, in all the world, Michael. Of which she replied, My darling dear, I really do love you, darling. But stated, I feel like suicide when you get angry. It absolutely ruined my marriage and it leads to all kinds of misery. I won't let you down. God knows why I should when you are so lovely. Take care. All my love. Really all. Elvira. It was a relationship as tragic and fractious as it was loving and deadly. As these two wastrels with nothing to offer the world bounced from party to party often drunk on drugs and claiming to live a liberated life where monogamy was shunned and yet they would condemn each other for cheating. Nobody really knew what went on behind their closed doors. But although in court, Michael was accused of only using her for money, among her popular friends, he was seen as nothing but a butler. Neither of them had any respect for their neighbours. As the hipsters of their day, they loved to brag about how they lived among the real people. And yet, they didn't know their names, their jobs, and sullied the cul-de-sac's peace with late-night parties and fights. Like a premonition of his death, one of those fights occurred on Thursday the 19th of May 1932, 12 days before his murder. As Mrs. Dorothy Hall, who lived directly opposite, recalled, It was 3.30 a.m. I was awakened by a terrible screaming out of Mrs. Barney's window. Elvira was naked and angry, telling him to go away. As he asked her for money, she wouldn't give him any, and she said, Go fish for it. As their arguments went, so far, so ordinary. Until Mrs. Barney looked out of a window and screamed to him, Laugh, baby, laugh for the last time, and fired. I heard the sound of firing, and I saw a flash and some smoke. After she had fired, she kind of fell inside the window, both laughing and crying. As although unhurt, Michael walked away. The next morning, he called on her. And once again, they were quite friendly, as if nothing had happened. But with their frequent fights becoming so commonplace, tragically, the neighbours would often ignore them. The night of the murder began like any other, with a raucous party. Elvira didn't give a wit that her hard-working neighbours had jobs and lives. As from the love hut, the cul-de-sac echoed with loud music, arrogant voices, and the popping of champagne corks. Inside, roughly 30 members of the Right Young Things parted hearty. Being crammed full of artists, poets, painters, and even a powerboat racer. Only Michael was little more than a helper who served drinks. At 9pm, giving much needed respite to the neighbours, the party decamped to the opulence of the Café de Paris in Piccadilly, where more drink, drugs and pretentious chat only added more fuel to the fire, after which they headed to the infamous Blue Angel Club on Dean Street to ruin their livers even further. Being half cut and arsehole, it was still dark when her car skidded into William Mews. As if their fight from the morning had never ceased, 
Their hurtful barbs could be heard before the car doors had even opened, as their bickering echoed across the cul-de-sac, causing some of the neighbours to slightly stir. As before, Dorothy Hall heard it all, but she saw very little. At roughly 4.30am, I heard screaming and shouting, which woke my baby. There was a light on in the top window. I heard Mrs. Barney, who was very hysterical, telling him to get out of her house at once. She then screamed out and said, I will shoot you. She said that twice, I will shoot you. He said he would be going, and then I heard a shot. One shot, followed by Michael crying, Good God, what have you done? And Elvira screaming, Chicken, come back to me. I heard Mrs. Barney call Michael twice, and then all was quiet. Which was odd, as Kate Stevens at number seven claimed. I heard four shots before the final one, a very loud one, and Mrs. Barney say, Michael, come back to me. I love you. And yet, William Liff, who was as close as any other, stated, I heard Mrs. Barney say, Go away or I'll shoot you. There was a pistol shot, followed by a groan and a thumping noise. But which was it? As all three witnesses had seen nothing, and yet what they'd heard was only observed through the haze of tiredness across a dark, echoey muse, having been awoken with a sharp start at an ungodly hour. And yet all of their statements contradicted how Elvira said the shooting had occurred. The socialite would later claim in a statement, which was endlessly reported by an adoring media. We arrived home at about 2 a.m., We had a quarrel about a woman he was fond of, her name being Dora. Inside the love hut, there was just Michael and Elvira, no one else. So we only have Elvira's side. She said, Michael threatened to leave me. I said, if you do, you know what will happen. As several times prior, with Charles, John and Michael, she tried to take her own life. He knew I kept a revolver. Last night, it was under the cushion of the chair near the bed. He knew where it was. He took it and said, I'm going to take it away for fear that you'll kill yourself, as Elvira was a danger to herself and to others. I ran after him and tried to get it back. But as the two struggled, with both of their hands gripped on the revolver, it went off. Elvira said. He looked surprised. I didn't know he was hurt. He went into the bathroom, half shut the door, and he said, fetch a doctor. I saw he looked ill, which his bloodstains would later prove. Summoning Dr. Durant to what would be described as a dreadful accident in which a man had shot himself. Upon arrival, the doctor declared Michael as dead. Detective Inspector William Winter arrived shortly afterwards to find Elvira in a hysterical state and willing to explain what had led to the death. With a revolver by his hand, an entry wound in his left lapel, an exit wound in his back, and the bullet having passed through his left lung, Filling his pleural cavity with four pints of blood, his cause of death was heart failure, for which he was conscious for roughly ten minutes before he collapsed and died. On the surface, it seemed like a very plausible accident. But by the man's dead hand lay a thirty-two revolver with three live rounds and two spent rounds in the barrel. But what was odd was the order of the bullets. 
They went, one life, one life, one spent, one life, and then one spent. As if at some point the barrel had been spun, like in a cruel game of Russian roulette. Four experts examined the body. Home Office pathologist Sir Bernard Spilsbury, Robert Churchill, the Mets gun specialist, Dr. Arnold Harbour, the police surgeon, and the detective. All of whom would state the following. The revolver was three to six inches from the body when it was fired. His hands were clean. There was no blacking or singeing. There were no scorch marks on the entry wound. And with Elvira wearing a kimono and knickers, no fingerprints were found on the gun as she wore gloves. That said, if the two of them were face to face and struggling with the gun, it was unlikely they would hold it at lung height. It would have been practically impossible for a man holding the butt of the revolver and struggling to have pulled the trigger, and with the gun being one of the safest revolvers ever made, requiring a lot of force, and with there being only space for one finger in the trigger guard, if two people had struggled with it, they'd have had great difficulty in pulling the trigger. When asked to give an account, Elvira, the pampered socialite, was petulant and flew into a temper. When told she would be taken to Gerald Road Police Station for questioning, she struck Sergeant Campion across the face, wailing, How dare you threaten to put me in a cell, you vile swine! Which he hadn't. Having to be restrained, with the police informing her mother, Lady Mullins, of the arrest, she barked, Now you know who my mother is, you will be a little more careful in what you say to me. When questioned, she was emotional, restless, as well as cold and callous, with her only thoughts being about herself. But as a self-interested socialite, it's what she did. Tried in court one of the Old Bailey on the 4th of July 1932, she pleaded not guilty to the charge of murder before a gallery packed full of journalists, as outside, her legion of fans protested her innocence. Putting on a show before her adoring crowd, rather than focusing on the details of the case, the press dedicated the first third of every article to her hair, her clothes, her brave demeanour, how she wept and raised a tiny bottle of smelling salts to her nose as her love letters were read out in court. But often what they forgot to even mention was the name of the victim, which many of them also got wrong. With many famous faces giving testimony as to her good character, and Michael being little more than an afterthought as the socialite hugged the limelight, with the jury retiring to consider all of the evidence against her. On Thursday the 7th of July, at 4.45pm, after just two hours, a verdict was returned. On the charge of murder, how do you find her? Not guilty. On the charge of manslaughter, how do you find her? Not guilty. And on the charge of grievous bodily harm, how do you find her? Not guilty. Unable to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she'd intended to kill him, Elvira Barney was acquitted of all charges and she walked free. Deluge with bouquets and congratulatory cards. This should have been the reawakening of her celebrity status. But with the bright young things having lost their sparkle, Elvira went into self-imposed exile. Three weeks after her acquittal, whilst travelling at high speeds and drunk, 
Elvira crashed a car near Cannes on the French south coast, seriously injuring Countess Caroline Carolee, and leading to yet another court case. Disowned by her family, divorced by John Barney, and with her upcoming marriage to Paris dress designer René Jean Caddy being postponed, she fell into a deep bout of depression and alcoholism. Three and a half years after the trial, having to be helped to her room by the porter at the Hotel de Colisée in Paris owing to hard drinking, on the Christmas day of 1936, 32-year-old Elvira Barney was found dead. She was alone, surrounded by a few belongings, her family photos, and with her fame almost gone, unlike the murder, her natural death was barely reported. Unlike many of those supposed bright young things, Elvira Barney's name has vanished into obscurity. Just as Michael's had at his own trial for his own death, but such is the curse of fame and infamy. As when a celebrity is beloved, no matter what, they are given the benefit of the doubt. And yet, when the other party isn't as liked, or as famous, or as praised by the press from whom most of us get our information, all too often the facts are cherry-picked, which best suit the celebrity. wasn't too bad that wasn't too terrible oh my lord hello everyone welcome to murder mile the unscripted unedited bit oh my god i'm sick as a dog but there you go still did it still managed to pull out an episode oh but what I've had, I've had a good couple of weeks oh, i've been away researching it may seem to you like I, the week has just carried on as normal but I, I was a couple of weeks ahead, so I thought, oh, I'll research the next 12 episodes, which has been good, so they're all done. And then and then my back went out, I got a slip disc, oh, and I've only just managed to get that fixed. So I'm back on my feet again, which is good. And then I started to feel rough, uh, and now I've got bronchitis again. So, uh, But there you go, still pulling out episodes. I like these lazy podcasters who go, oh, I'm too tired, oh, I had to do the laundry, <laughs> Oh, so much going on. Even though I'm on death's door, I'm still going to pull out an episode for you. So I hope you enjoyed that. That was the case of uh, Elvira Barney. I hadn't... <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, you're going to hear a lot of that during this. If you don't like coughing and you don't like snuffling sounds, don't listen to this extra mile. I am warning you now, because I know some people go, Oh, one star! He was coughing all over the episode. If you don't like coughing, don't listen to this episode. I'm going to blow my nose now, because I have to. So, Oh, it's horrible. I've got a big bag next to my desk. And in there, it's like a basketball hoop. And in there, I toss in my snotty rags. I've got two massive bags of snot rags. Oh, I might have to have some more drugs. Thank God for Sudafed. I managed to get through the night last night with some Sudafed. They're really good, but I barely got any sleep. Anyway, hopefully this shit will go soon. So every time I go on the tube, every time I go on the tube, there's normally someone on there who doesn't wash and doesn't just oh, some dirty bastard. And I always get sick on the tube. I hate the tube. Oh, I hate the people on the tube. Anyway, this is extra mile. It's going to be a grumpy version, a grumpy sore version. Um. So what else is going on? Uh, oh, um, I'll, I'll put a link. I'm going to open a window, sorry. I need some effing fresh air. Oh, fresh air and some daylight. Hang on. Oh, there we go. It's a bit better. Oh, I'm feeling lightheaded. Oh, my stomach hurts now as well. Oh, fuck. Oh. 
I'm amazed I got through. I got, I got through that episode relatively quickly, considering I, I can barely. I'm really tired. Uh, uh, yeah. When is it coming up? End of this month. I'm going to put a note in the uh, the diary. But if you live in South Shields or near South Shields, on Sunday the second of June in the evening at seven thirty, uh, myself. Adam from UK True Crime and Paul from True Crime Enthusiast. We're doing a show called uh, Murder Ain't Easy. Tickets are about 15 quid. It's a two-hour show. Um, uh, I'll put a link in the show notes. But yeah, if, if if you're in that area, come along. It'd be good. It's just a, they, they, the event invited us to come along. So it wasn't one we were planning to do. But uh, they said, oh, do you want to do a show? And we're like, yeah, go on. That sounds good. So... Uh, um, if it goes well we might do some more because we do enjoy doing the live shows so uh yeah that'll be a giggle so there'll be a link in the show notes i haven't really bigged that up that well just too tired sorry um i'm gonna say a big thank you to patreon subscribers i'm gonna say thank you to sasha claire bragg simon lamb kaylee mclachlan and nancy so thank you for becoming patreon subscribers of course you get all the you get uh, a lot of crime scene photos in there. You get the uh, the uh, unedited recording script. You get access. Everyone gets access to bad nanometers, which is people seem to be enjoying. Uh, that's where I share. Sometimes we read like a full witness statement, so you can get a full story, uh, or, or we get two versions of it, and that that can be good fun. People seem to enjoy that. So that's good. So thank you, Sasha and Claire and Simon and Kaylee and Nancy. Thank you very much. Thank you. For become patron subscribers it's very much appreciated um i'm gonna do some uh oh michael you haven't put your extra stuff in there you tit this is why i'm so tired i forgot to do stuff um let's do some quiz questions and then i will uh, uh try and remember what i was going to do for extra stuff so i wrote most of this in a haze of kind of um bronchitis and drugs so my brain wasn't working at the end um question number one what was elvira's middle name question number two what color was elvira's hair question number three elvira's younger sister was previously married to who question number four what was elvira's stage name i'm just gonna see if my coffee is cooled down I had a swig of it halfway through the show and it was boiling hot and I didn't realise because I'm too tired until I put it in my mouth and realised it was bloody hot and I burnt my mouth. Oh, good. Ugh, there's an annoying child outside. We're still in We're still in Easter and the little bastards have been on holiday for two weeks and you can hear them outside going, wee, doing that horrible high-pitched noise the little bastards do. Shut up, you little bastard. Oh, kids. What a waste of time. Um, question number five. What play did Elvira appear in? Question number six. The autobiography of Charles Graves. Oh, that was barely a word. The autobiography of Charles Graves was called what? Question seven. What injuries did Elvira get after a car crash in Picc Piccadilly? Question eight. Oh, someone's decided to have a, a conversation outside the boat. It's really annoying. People do that. They just stop and go, oh, how's your piles? Oh, yeah, my piles are good. Oh, oh. I just hate it. Really annoying. Uh, question number eight. What was Michael's real name? You can just say he's his first name for that if, if you want to. Question number nine. What job was it said that Michael did? And question number ten. What was the name of the woman who Michael supposedly loved? Oh, Ooh, it's things are hotting up now. So let's uh, let's have a look. Um, someone's uh, ranting at each other. Um, well, let's. It's kind of interesting with the um, as you said before with witnesses. Witnesses can be really. Um, uh, we saw this with the Soho Strangler, with the, with the final case. 
Oh, shut up. Fuck's sake. Oh, people love to come to the canal and shout. I think because it's an open space and they think, oh, I can let, I can shout as much as I like, but they forget that some of us live here. This is our home. We wouldn't, we wouldn't stand on your front garden and start shouting. Or throw, even, for, even worse is when we get accused of, uh, people go, oh, look at the rubbish in the canal. Oh, all the boaters. It's like, no, we live here. We don't pollute our waters. It's you guys turning up with your fucking picnics going, oh, I'll just leave my picnic here. I'm all right. I'll have my McDonald's and I'll just dump it. My, my, my McDonald's. My McDonald's. People who have McDonald's like to say, my McDonald's. Um, yeah, with, with the, the witnesses to uh, the shooting, it's, it's amazing because they're, they're all equidistant to each other. They're all about only about 25, 30 feet away from each other. The houses are pretty close and they're not exactly made of sturdy stuff because they used to be stables. Uh, and it's a muse so it's all it's a little bit echoey but you know they're, they're all kind of near each other but then you have Dorothy saying it happened about 4 30 she heard screaming she heard a single shot then uh Michael said good god what have you done um and Mrs Barney screaming chicken apparently that was her nickname for him chicken mm chicken come back to me i will do anything you want you i will do anything you want me to do um and then apparently she said michael twice and it all went quiet quiet but kate stevens who was a number eight said she heard she heard at least four shots maybe five which is kind of interesting but what she heard Elvira say was something entirely different whereas William Liff who lived in number 18 which was almost next door um, he said as I got to the window I heard Mrs Barney say go away or shoot you see this baby uh, and I heard the noise of a revolver being fired now some people say there's one shot some people say there's two some people say there's four or five so it's weird that but don't forget people have just woken up you know their memory's not going to be good they're going to be hearing different things um some of them may have heard this while they were still asleep and then you'll you'll be misremembering things later on um let's dive into some some of the stuff that may not have made it into the episode um it's it's hard to really pin down where she says there was no fighting going on in the bedroom um, there was a little bit of a struggle that went on in the bedroom. In the bedroom was where she kept the gun. It was under a pillow next to uh, on a under a, on a under a pillow on a chair next to her bed. Um, and he knew that's where the gun was. She would move the gun every so often, but for some reason that night he knew where the gun was. We don't know why. Maybe she had pulled out the gun and used it on, on him earlier on, or maybe he'd sat down on the chair and gone, "Oh, what's that? Oh, it's a gun! Bloody hell!" Um, there was a lot of difficulty her to, don't forget this is nearer before there were really ambulances so she called Dr Thomas Durant who was a doctor but this is 4.30 in the morning so it, it took quite a while to get through to him because he wasn't picking up his phone and that was who she was calling was Dr Durant uh, in Las Lancaster Gate Terrace which is not not too far away but it's still a bit of a trek um he came in uh saw the body on the floor uh four to five inches away from the knuckle was the gun so i'm gonna have to blow my nose again hang on here it comes and one in the back there we go uh he said there was no rigor mortis no pulse he was recently dead probably been dead about a few minutes to half an hour mrs barney was overwrought and frenzied uh, he sent for the police and she said oh don't do that you must not do that uh, I had to control her she was hysterical um, he tried to calm her and ask her what happened but she just wasn't having any of it um, uh, there was a bullet hole that there was a bullet hole in her wardrobe uh, and another hole in the side of the wall and the inspector at the time looked at it and she said 
uh, oh no, that's nothing, that happened a couple of days ago. Now, it wasn't really explained where that came from, which is why I didn't pin it in the story, but it could have been, this was the one from the 19th of May, the earlier shooting that we'd talked about before. But um, because the police weren't called to that one, um, it wasn't really raised at that point. Um, uh, so Bernard Spilsbury said it was not possible, but extremely improbable for a man to have shot himself, self given the direction of the bullet. Everyone seems to have said that around uh, around this point about if you're thinking about two people holding, so they're wrestling to get the gun off each other. As I think it was the gun expert Robert Churchill quite rightly said, if two people are wrestling with a gun, the person who is holding the gun is most likely to be holding the butt because you wouldn't hold any other part of the gun. Mostly, if you were to be wrestling the gun off the other person, you wouldn't be wrestling the butt off them as well. Because the butt is only big enough for one hand. Barely two hands, and especially not four hands. So the other person is more likely to be holding onto the barrel. Which, of course, is a little bit slippy. Um, but you, when you think about that, you think about Michael walked away with the gun. Therefore, he's more likely to have the gun facing away from him. Um, it, it just doesn't match up. Also, the, the, the bullet went through the front of his chest. No, Sorry. the bullet went through his chest um, not too far from his heart and into his lung so that's quite high if you're thinking you're wrestling with a gun you would think you'd be wrestling you around stomach height but this wasn't this was around chest height also three to six inches away it's not massively away from the chest but you would if it was a wrestling situation you would assume it would be a bit a bit closer than that but yeah, there were no powder burns on his clothes, no scorch marks, which you would have expected if if maybe he'd killed himself. Um, what else have we got? Uh, uh, yeah, Elvira wearing gloves. That's kind of an odd, odd detail that no one seems to ever pick up with this, is the fact that she was wearing a kimono and knickers, so she clearly got herself ready for bed. But she was also wearing gloves. Why she was wearing gloves, we don't know. Maybe her hands were cold. Um, maybe they were more kind of dress gloves. Do you know, maybe she's the kind of pretentious person who who uh, wears something fancy to bed. So you go, oh, I need to, I need to make sure my hair looks wonderful before I go to bed. So, so if I die in my sleep, everyone will go, oh, dear, she died looking wonderful. She's that kind of pretentious person who I'm guessing would probably do that. So that could be the reason why she was wearing gloves. Um, yeah, there was no blacking or singeing of the hands, which you would have expected, none at all, none on his shirt sleeves, jacket sleeves, or the wrists. There was very little blood as well. Um, he was shot, where was that piece that said before? Um, so Bernard Spilsbury said, uh, the blood on his, on him, that there was, was coming straight down. So this man had been standing or sitting up during a conscious period after the injuries were inflicted. Um, they reckon that the shooting happened probably in the hallway between the bedroom and the um, uh, the bathroom, and that he died in the bathroom. There were four pints of blood in his pleural cavity. Cause of death was heart failure due to the passage of blood through the left lung. He was conscious for a short time, they reckon, roughly 10 minutes. Then he collapsed and died. Um, the revolver was not touching or was very close to the body and the distance of at least three to six inches from the body. Um, from the position of the wound, it is unlikely to be a self-inflicted injury. Oh, I got burpees, sorry. Um, so it's it's one of those... Th there's a little bit of sexism from Sir Bernard Spilsbury in here. Uh when uh, he was uh, getting testimony from her as well uh, Elvira and he said uh, this weapon would be extremely unlikely to go off if two people struggled with it I don't suggest that a woman couldn't pull the trigger with her finger I, un I understand it is a strong pull certainly a man could pull it with his finger there you go ladies deal with that as you wish Sir Bernard was not the most tactful man it's weird though isn't it there's a lot of these pathologists who you'd expect to be quite clinical in their approach to things but Sir Bernard is a bit, little bit of a sexist and then you've got um, 
I can't remember who it was, one of the later pathologists in the 1950s, who is a massive, um, uh, he, he hates the gay people. I think we, we covered that one with the, um, the, the Labour leader. Um, yep, uh, Robert Churchill, the gunmaker, said um, uh, it was a 32 calibre five chamber American made hammerless gun. Um, two chambers had recently been fired, although he couldn't determine what recently was. Uh, the revolver was in good working order. It needs 14 pounds to discharge it, so it, it wasn't a hair trigger. The trigger guard admits only one finger. This is one of the safest revolvers ever made. The hammer cannot be cocked by hand. Uh, so they looked at it and they, they said it was highly unlikely that this was an accident. You'd have to physically pull the trigger. Um, I think we've already covered the bit. Uh, Elvira, not really what, being very hysterical. I mean, you, you can understand that. She, her, the man she claims to have loved is, loved is dead. But um, also she may have killed him. So she's clearly upset. She did, she has a real disregard for people who are lower than her. And by that rationale, she determines that it, anyone who's not as wealthy as her parents is, is below her. And she just no no regard for rank or, or people's jobs or anything like that. Stuck up little fucker that she is. Um uh when the the detectives wanted some ex explanation she just kept saying it's terrible leave me alone she's just really thinking about herself uh and as mentioned um sergeant campion suggested um that she needed to go to uh Gerald road police station for the purpose of making a statement that's exactly the words he used she refused she wanted to go upstairs to find another coat uh, Sergeant Campion suggested that the coat downstairs being a fur coat which would be much more suitable and that she might find it rather cold at the police station. Mrs Barney rushed across where he stood and struck him in a, in a blow to the right of his face and said I'll teach you to tell me to put I'll teach you to tell me you will put me in a cell you vile swine which he didn't and therefore she had to be restrained. Um as expected, because her parents are, are wealthy, the police couldn't just take the police couldn't just take her to the police station. They had to call up her mother, Lady Mullins. Hello, is Lady Mullins there? Blah, 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 blah. Oh yes, you are there. All that shit. And Sir John. Oh, Sir John. Yes. Blah blah blah. Ah, oh, slicky, ah, slicky. Oh, you've got a title. Therefore, we have to treat you better than everyone else. Fuck off. So, um, they on the way to the station, they had to go to. Sir John and Lady Mullins home with her first. Um, so. <coughs> <coughs> ah, fuck's sake. So. Um, uh, I can't remember. My brain's gone. Um, she was arrested. She said, I, I did not shoot him. I am not guilty. In her, she would eventually give a statement, but her, her statement is so vague. So, Vic, uh, I might probably do her statement in a bad nanometer, so if you're a Patreon subscriber, you will hear it there. Uh, taken into Holloway Prison, she was examined. Oh, I'm going to have to blow my nose now. Hang on. Oh, my God. I'm, I'm just king of snot. Why is there so much snot? Uh, oh, my stomach hurts as well. Uh, so she went. She went to Holloway Prison. Oh, for fuck's sake! Uh, a couple of bruises on her arms. Um, some new, some old. We know that they had a very volatile relationship. Um, she talked about the bad things he'd done. He talked about the bad things she'd done. So it's one of those relationships where it's really volatile, and you just say just just split up from each other i know you believe that you're madly in love but it's really not worth it just give up um unfortunately they couldn't see that um uh she still got injuries from the car accident earlier on uh, but when she was in there she was mentally rational no signs of delusions or hallucinations her conduct was normal except they said on two occasions she became hysterical but it was declared that she was of sound mind and fit to stand trial uh, 
else have we got? What else have we got? Won't do that. Won't do that. Won't do that. Won't do that. As mentioned in the trial, all the press went on about was, if you look at any article for it, it's all about what she was wearing, uh, how 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 she composed herself. Oh, how how hard it was hearing the the uh, the love letters being read out, and how oh, oh she was weeping and she she almost collapsed several times. And I think that's what's really interesting is we still have this kind of idea at the moment of if it's a celebrity. Sorry, I'm going to blow my nose again. Oh, snotty. If it's a... If it's a celebrity, we kind of give them the benefit of the doubt. Like, um, I was talking to some friends about Michael Jackson and uh, the whole you know, is he a paedophile thing they're like no it can't be it's not a paedophile it can't be a paedophile have you not heard his songs his songs are brilliant and their whole thing was they love his music therefore he can't be a paedophile and it's like but you're you're not focusing on the facts you're not focusing on the truth about anything it's like you find that with with uh, people quite often is that um they won't focus on the truth what they'll say is i believe this therefore it should be right or i've spent my life believing this therefore i don't want to believe it's wrong because otherwise that makes me look wrong and unfortunately that's that's the it's the same with politics isn't it it's like someone could be you know your favorite politician could be seen walking down the street with a doing a nazi salute with a big sign saying i hate brown people and and fuck the jews and do you know most of us would go well that's wrong do you know we're going to get rid of that bastard but some people if they voted for that person all their life they go no 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 he's just expressing his opinion do you know we'll find any excuse to support them because they don't want to be seen to be wrong and you can see that here as well is that they've spent all this time putting her on a pedestal making her front page and going oh elvira barney has another car crash wow celebrity car crash for and of course ignoring the people that she's probably maimed in her car um but that's while she's riding high the second that her status is kind of comes crashing down nobody wants to know which you can kind of see with her death um with her death so i as mentioned (laughs) Uh, with a um <sighs> brain's not working uh with her uh, her trial um she gets acquitted of murder manslaughter and gbh so she gets nothing she essentially walks free because they couldn't really prove anything um and her death as well we don't really know much about it it wasn't reported so all we know is christmas day um she disowned her family she'd moved to france she was found dead in a paris hotel room on the 25th of december 1936 after returning from drunk from a night out uh, she was fully dressed um she'd been in a series of cafes in the latin quarter uh, a bar in montmartre uh, she died wearing a fur coat at the hotel de Colly. A luxury hotel off the Champs Elysees. Uh, it was said to be natural causes, and the porter had to help her up to her room that night because she was in a weak condition. Um, death was said to be congestion, which is very vague. So, I'm going to leave it there, folks. I'm running out of energy, and I, I can't, I can barely talk. Um, so let's do the quiz questions. Okay. Question number one. What was Elvira's middle name? It was Enid. Question number two. What colour was Elvira's hair? It was Auburn. Question number three. Elvira's younger sister was previously married to who? That was Ernest Simpson, who was the ex-husband of Wallace Simpson, whose relationship with Edward VIII, King Edward VIII, almost broke down the monarchy. Uh, question number four, what was her stage name? Dolores Ashley. Question number five, what play did she appear in? The Blue Kitten. Question number six, the autobiography of Charles Graves was called what? The Bad Old Days. Question number seven, what injuries did Elvira get after the car crash in Piccadilly? She broke a jaw and lost a tooth. She also injured a passenger as well. But then again, in the press, they just ignored that. 
Um, question number eight. What was Michael's real name? Full name, Michael William Scott Stephen. But if he said Thomas... Sorry, I got that wrong. Um, Thomas William Scott Stephen. But if he said Thomas, that's fine. Question number nine. What job was Michael's... What job was it said Michael did? He was a dress designer in Paris. And question number 10. What was the name of the woman who supposedly Michael loved? It was Dora. So that's me done, folks. That's literally me done. So uh, have yourself a good week, folks. Stay safe and be good and try not to get bronchitis. Um, lots of love, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you for listening to the show. Bye-bye. <laughs>